I hope that our, our sermon series that we've been walking through in the book of Matthew since Christmas has been edifying to you. I hope it has built you up. I hope you have seen God move in these things. But I want to let you know everything up to this point has been a drum roll. Everything up to this point has been a buildup of getting us to this moment where we're about to step into. You see, so far in the book of Matthew, we've talked about little baby Jesus. Um, and we, we got to read about Jesus coming, and we got to read this, this lineage that led up to Jesus, and that he was the prophesied one, he was the Messiah, he was the one that was going to come and change everything. And then we got into this guy named John the Baptist, who was out there just baptizing people, saying, your life requires some major changes because God is about to come near. And all of this is just building up this drum roll saying, God is about to come near, something is about to happen. And last week, Jonathan led us through Matthew chapter four, where Jesus goes out in the desert and faces his arch nemesis, the devil himself, and stands up to temptation and is tempted not to begin his ministry and is tempted to do all of these things instead of follow the way of Jesus instead of follow God into what he's called. But everything up to this point has been a drum roll. It's all been building up to this moment because Jesus hasn't really stepped on the scene yet. It's all been building up to this moment because up till now, John the Baptist is out there preaching, goes, the Lamb of God is coming. And then he sees Jesus and goes, that's him. And then Jesus like disappears for about a month and a half and nobody hears from him. He's out in the desert. Nobody sees him. Until finally he comes back onto the scene and everybody's been looking for him and his ministry begins. And like the passage that JC just read us, it says that the world is turned upside down on its head. And so today I want to get into this introduction. And bear in mind, today is really just the introduction still of what we're getting into with this series you see, we're about to get into a series with Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount, which teaches us the way of Jesus, that this is how he expects us to live, and we're still in the midst of this drum roll, but now we get the introduction to it. And it simply says this in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, I'm uh, sorry, beginning in verse 12, it says this. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Uh, Spoiler alert, John is now in prison. In chapter 3, we saw him out in the desert. He was baptizing people. He was telling people uh, the really harsh message that their life had to change and what would be expected of them. And as people came and talked to John, he would tell them, hey, your life is expected to look more like God. You have to prepare the way. There's some major adjustments that have to be made. And he didn't just preach the message to those who came out in the desert. He held nothing back. So when the king of the time, Herod, goes and visits his brother and comes back with his brother's wife, who is also his niece, who he stole from his brother. And so now he's married to his sister-in-law slash niece wife. And John goes, dude, you don't need a Bible to tell you that's all kind of messed up. And Herod didn't like to hear that. And so he will preach the gospel and Herod will have him arrested. And for several months, John will sit in prison and Herod will walk down and visit him. Because while he doesn't like what John has to say, he cannot deny the words of this man are so compelling. There's something different about his teaching, and he feels God moving. And slowly, Herod's heart starts to change, and it begins to freak out his family. So sister-in-law, niece wife, is hearing no more of it. So she sends in her daughter, John's sister-in-law, niece wife, second cousin removed. I'm not sure. It gets really messed up at this point. She dances for him, whatever implications that brings with it. And he is so pleased with her, whatever implications that brings with it. He promises her a wish, a grant, whatever she asks for. And her mom told her, go ask for the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. We're going to serve it for dinner. Not as dinner, but it's going to be the centerpiece. And John will be beheaded. And it says, after John is arrested because he refuses not to proclaim the truth. And oh, there are people who, when the truth begins to be proclaimed, they will be threatened by it. They do not like it. They don't want the word to continue. And the moment that people start to actually begin to listen to it, they'll be threatened by it as well. It says, John was arrested. And so Jesus withdrew to the region of Galilee. And then it gives us a little bit of description about the region of Galilee. Of course, if you've ever been to Israel or if you've ever looked at a map of Israel, which we don't usually do, I should put a map of Israel up on the screen. That would be really helpful right now. I didn't think about that till just now. 
He withdrew to Galilee, and he left Nazareth, which is where he was from, and he went to Capernaum, which was the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali were two of the twelve tribes of Israel, and it says, in the allotment that they got of the promised land, there's a lake there called Galilee. It's known as Galilee of the Gentiles. And he gives us an idea of what this was. It was the promised land for the Israelites, and yet it's occupied by the Gentiles. This is a militarized zone. The Romans have come in and they have conquered the area. And the Jews are living amongst their conquerors around the region of Galilee. So in Galilee, you have cities like Capernaum and you have cities like whatever other cities are out there. And then you also have these Roman cities, the Decapolis, and you have uh, all these other areas. And they're all living together around this lake. And this is where Jesus, Jesus chooses to go to begin his story where history is all colliding together, where there is a conflict of worldviews, this is where we meet Jesus. And I don't think it's by accident that it tells us that he was in this area. And then it says all of this was to fulfill the prophecy listed in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, by the way, this is Isaiah chapter 9 where it says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of shadow, a light has dawned. And it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. It says Jesus went to the area and he had this basic message. And from what you're going to find here on out, every single message of Jesus will come back to this one theme. What Matthew has done for us is he's done the hard work of the gospel, going through the entirety of the book of Matthew and says, hey, if you can summarize the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you could summarize his message into one sentence, what would it be? See, a lot of us might say, oh, love God, love people. That's what we've been trained to believe. Jesus' message was love God, love people. It all comes down to that. Matthew goes, no, that's not it. Well, Jesus' message just comes down to, like, love your enemies and, and, and love those who persecute you. And Matthew's like, no, that's, that's not really it either. You see, if you boil Jesus' message down to one sentence, according to Matthew, it's this. Repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And every single message that Jesus preaches from this point forward, this will be the center of it. See, this word is, and right away, Jesus begins to flip our expectations on their heads. He begins with this word, repent. Who can tell me what the word repent means? Just yell it out loud, especially if you're online watching. Thanks for watching us online, by the way. You can yell it out loud to your living room and nobody will disagree with you. Uh, what does the word repent mean? Turn. What did you say? Run away. I like that. You turn. You turn. Okay. This idea of repent simply means you have to come to the point of making a decision and turn. The way you're heading is not working. The way you're living life is not, is not working out well for you. So find a new method. You see, Jesus is going to call us to this point where we have to make a decision. And that decision is going to come down to this. Hey, the way you're doing it doesn't work. You have to turn. We're about to get in some really difficult messages uh, in the months of February, April, May, and June, where we're going through this, these three chapters of Jesus' messages. We're going to get into messages that are going to talk about your sexuality. We're going to get into messages that talk about the way you view other people. We're going to get into messages that are going to dig deep into your wounding about how you, uh, the people who have hurt you and how you're supposed to love them and forgive them. We're going to get into messages that talk about the way you're supposed to work with that um, antagonistic person at your workplace. We're going to get into messages that talk about how you're supposed to handle your money. We're going to get into some very invasive stuff that's going to trouble you. And every single time, the message is going to come back to repent, turn, stop doing it your way. This is the new way, which is a crazy way to live. It would be crazy to love your enemies. Do you know why? Because it doesn't work. When someone is attacking you, and for you to come with a pacifistic way and respond to them with love, it's only going to get you beat up. For you to invest all of your money in, not in this world, but in the next world, that, that doesn't make any sense. Because you miss out on everything this world has to offer. And every one of these messages that Jesus says doesn't make sense to repent unless, there's this next sentence in there, which says the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. And that changes everything. 
And it drives us to this moment of the choice we have to make. Which is crazy, because most of us, when we think about the kingdom of heaven, what do you think of? Heaven. Heaven, exactly. You think of, one day I will die, and I will go to heaven, and immediately Jesus flips us on his head. Even to those of us who are like professional Christians, okay, who have been Christians for like a very long time and like do it really well. We think of heaven as the place where you go when you die. You don't think of heaven as something that comes to you. And instantly, Jesus takes the most basic concept of heaven and goes, no, 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 it's not something you go to. It's on its way here. All right, Jesus, now I'm really confused. Like, what are you talking about? And Jesus will get us into this idea of the kingdom of heaven is actually invading where we are. The kingdom of heaven is not something we're going to go to. It's coming to us. And that will require a decision that you have to make in every area of your life to turn and follow the way of God or continue on your own way. You see, Jesus is going to force each and every one of us into a decision. And he's coming right out to people and say, repent, because Kevin is coming near. A couple of things that this means, this new idea, and I wanted to tell you this. There are a couple of notes I wanted to make on heaven before we get going. The first thing is this, that the kingdom of God, and, and uh, just on the kingdom of God, forget the notes for a second. I want you to know this. This is why Matthew identifies this as the main theme of Jesus' message. Because Jesus will talk about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God 55 times in the book of Matthew. Now, in my Bible, the book of Matthew lasts for 27 pages. It's like 27 pages long. In your Bible, it may be 30, depending on the font size and all those kind of things. Which means that on average, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God twice per page. That's a pretty big theme in, in Scripture. It's a pretty big theme of Jesus' message. And he goes, I really want you to understand this, which is why we can't miss this. And yet we go back to our basic understanding, thinking heaven is a place we go to. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. Let me flip that on its head. You have to understand what I mean about the kingdom of heaven. And so if you will, I just want to theologically nerd out on you for just like 10 minutes about the kingdom of heaven. Because if we don't understand this, we will never understand why we have to turn, why we have to make the choices. And every other message we get into, you're like, why would I love my enemies? That's crazy. Because the kingdom of heaven is coming here. And if we miss this, then there's a danger we could miss everything else. All right, so a couple notes about the kingdom of heaven. Number one, and we wrote it down in your creek notes, is this. The kingdom of heaven is both future and present. The kingdom of heaven is both future and present. You see, when we talk about heaven, I don't want to deny heaven. I don't want to say it's not a place we go when we die. It is. But it's more than just future. It is also present. You see, the kingdom of heaven is not a place that does just exist like in the ethereal plane of God or whatever that is. It's not just a place that exists where God is. It is actually here and coming towards us right now. It is both future and it's present. Another way we phrased it, the same thing, is the kingdom of heaven is not just a later, it is a now. It's not just a later, it is a now. And most of us don't view it that way. And it's not like, well, okay, I know that my grandmother has passed away and now she is in heaven. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying the kingdom of heaven is here on earth. Who, who sings that song? Oh, heaven is a place on earth. Anybody? Who? Oh, sure, I'll go with that. I believe David. He's a music guy. He knows what he's talking about. I just know the song. It's been in my head all week because I've been preaching this and I didn't look it up. You see, another way we phrase this is this. The kingdom of heaven is a place. It's a place where we'll go to. It's a place where God is. It's a place where we will dwell forever with our king. A lot of great messages about that, not this one. But it's also a way of life. You see, the kingdom of heaven is a place, but it's also a way. It's a way in which we live our life. It's a way that we live. Because in point number three, and I want you to catch this, and I'm front-loading all the notes here, and then I'm going to get into why this is the case. The king's rule and reign determines his kingdom. The king's rule and reign determines his kingdom. You see, when the original hearers of Jesus' message would have heard a message like, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, 
they probably would have heard it not as if the kingdom of heaven was some far off place that we go to. They would have heard it more like the news of Paul Revere. The redcoats are coming. The British are coming. There is an invasion on the way. They would have heard the kingdom of heaven is coming near as a trumpeted warning, as a herald coming and saying, hey, there's an invading army on the way. The redcoats are coming. And because they were a people who regularly had been taken over by kingdom after kingdom. The kingdom of the Babylonians is drawing near. Everybody watch out. You see, it was part of their scriptures. It was part of their Old Testament. It was part of their Bible. Hey, the kingdom of the Egyptians has taken over and we are slaves. The kingdom of the, of, of the Persians is coming near and they're going to take over. And now the kingdom of the Romans has drawn near and they are ruling over us. And once again, Jesus is saying, there is a new kingdom coming. You see, the expanse of your kingdom was always determined by how much you ruled or reigned. It was determined by how much you could conquer, how much you took over of the area. right? And so a king's reign, a king's domain was defined by where his rule began and ended. All right, now let's apply that to the kingdom of God for a second. The kingdom of God begins and ends where God is recognized as your rightful king. Which means that when you recognize God as the king of your life or of certain areas of your life, his kingdom expands. Every time a new person enters into the water of baptism, which says, my old life is done, I am living a new life, there is a new way. It's not just about my future location in heaven. Right now, I am serving the kingdom of heaven. I am now a citizen of that kingdom. Why? Because I acknowledge him as my king. You see, it's not like we drew borders. It's not like people said, hey, you know, the Rio Grande Valley is the border of the great state of Texas. It's not like people came and they said, hey, this latitude line, this longitude line, this is where the borders of this state or this nation will be. It was simply wherever the influence of the kingdom existed and whoever you recognized as the rightful ruler, you were part of their kingdom. So when you recognize Jesus Christ as the rightful ruler of the world, you become part of his kingdom, which also means that your life becomes part of his kingdom depending on the areas of your life that you surrender over to him, which means that every time you grow in Jesus, one of these main things that we exist to do, the kingdom of heaven expands. In areas of your life which you have previously not given over to God, every time you surrender those to him, his kingdom grows. And every person who comes and hears the name of Jesus Christ and begins to surrender their life to him, the kingdom grows. And Jesus says, listen, the kingdom of heaven is not just about later, it is expanding now, it is advancing now, it is on the move. I love that line from C.S. Lewis's book slash and or movie, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where they simply say, Aslan is on the move. It's this idea of a lion that is on the move. His kingdom is advancing. And the kingdom of God is not only advancing, but it's coming towards you. So you have to decide what you're going to do about it. Uh, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this idea of kingdom of God. So, very quickly, can anyone tell me the first time that ruling or our kingship is mentioned in Scripture? Does anyone know where that applies? You can speak out loud, at home or here. What's that again? Genesis 1, page 1 of your Bible. Man, John knows all the answers. That's great. All right, so page 1 of your Bible. God creates the world. He creates an order to the world. Not only does he create the world, but he creates the order in which it lives in. He goes on this, this uh, beautiful rhyme and rhythm of creating the world, saying, hey, he created the principles of physics and the existence of the universe. He created the sun and the moon and the way that things order. And after he orders and structures and develops this entire world and the class system and the difference between plants and animals and everything you studied in seventh grade biology, after God develops everything there, then he says, I'm going to create human beings... And they are going to what? Rule. You guys rule. Which, honestly, we don't know what to do with. Because God said, I've given you dominion over the birds of the air and the fish in the sea and the, the, the cattle on the ground. And we're like, oh, neat. But when was the last time you just walked outside to a flock of birds and go, I rule you. <laughs> do what I say. And had that work out for you in some way. It doesn't really. Sometimes we go out into the ocean and we're like, ha I will claim dominion over these fish. And then they don't bite and it doesn't work out either. 
Uh, see, what do you do now that you've been assigned to rule? What, what does that mean that we have been created to rule alongside God? Well, first it tells us a lot about God. Number one, that we worship a God who after creating everything, after creating the entirety of the universe, decides to share rule over it with you. You see, it makes sense that God would say, I created everything, I shall rule over it. But on page one, he throws us for a loop by saying, I created everything, I designed all the order of it, and you are, you're now the ruler. You see, it's this idea that, once again, just going into C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia, when the Pevensey children come together, he calls them kings and queens of Narnia. Like as if they were born to rule. And yet that's how God describes us. You see, the Hebrew words uh, for king and rule are actually the same word. For example, if, if you're a runner, what do you do? You run. Like, that's, that's what you do. You're a runner. If you are a king, you king. If you are a ruler, you rule. And that's what it says. You rule because you are rulers. Which is weird about God. That he would instantly decide to let you rule his kingdom. And the rest of the story of the Bible is about us trying to usurp the kingdom of God when he's already given it over to us to rule, us taking it for himself, ourselves, and not ruling it his way. It's like the picture if I owned a coffee shop and I made you shift manager of that coffee shop. And I said, hey, it's mine. I built it. I invested in it. I bought the coffee. I contacted the guys who roasted the beans. And like I did all of the work now you manage what I've created. You come here. You, and you might walk around that coffee shop acting like you rule it, acting like you own it, and all your employees are irritated to you because of it, because you're the shift manager over it. And yet, you're not managing it the way that I instructed you to, because I instructed you to manage it with a heart of generosity, with a heart of love, with benefiting other people, with serving high-quality coffee, not like burnt swill, and, and it's this idea that says, listen, you are managing everything I've created, and then you try to change the way it's done. Now, if I were in that position, and I owned a coffee shop, and you were a bad manager, do you know what I would do? I'd fire you. <laughs> I'd ax you. Like, you're gone. Why? Because you're not managing it the way I instructed. You're not managing it in the way that I want this to be organized. And then you tried to take the deed from me. You tried to own it for yourself, and you tried to change everything I had made, and you twisted it into this warped, evil thing. And then I would bring in a new manager. And I would think that God would do the same thing, except for that would mean that you and I, who have taken over his world, claimed it as our own, and twisted it into this evil, warped thing, would be like axed, not just fired, like pfft, on fire. And like, that's what should happen. And yet God does something entirely different. He doesn't come and he goes, you're fired for it. He comes and he works with the manager, hands on and says, no, 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 no. I want to change you till you have a heart like mine because I want you to rule and I want you to live in such a way that I designed you to do it. You see, God says, I don't want a new manager. It would be so easy, guys, just to start over. Just to say, like, listen, People suck. Like, I'm done with a lot of them. How many of you have said that, like, this week? All right, cool, cool. Honest people in church. I love it. And yet, that's not what God does. See, God simply says, I wanted to work with you. I know I could fire you. I know I could bring somebody else in. I actually want to work with you because I've designed you to rule. But you need to manage it my way. The entire story of Scripture is about God trying to take the rule of this planet and have it done his way. And it begins all the way with this conflict with Pharaoh. And he comes to Pharaoh and he goes, listen, let my people go. And Pharaoh goes, you don't know me. More accurately, Pharaoh goes, I don't know you. I don't know this God. I don't know what he's telling me to do. I'm not listening. And Pharaoh takes off the gloves and then so does God. And they go at it and God says, no, no, no. Let's be very clear about who the owner is. Like, I have given this to you, and you're not doing it my way. 
And he frees the people of Israel from the rule of Pharaoh. And then you know what happens? He sets them up in their own kingdom, in their own land, which he gives them. And he goes, this is going to be great. And they become exactly like Pharaoh. And they get twisted. And they start ruling it all for themselves. And God goes, you've got to be kidding me. This is not remotely what I set you up for. And God says, listen, new plan. It's the original plan. The kingdom of God is going to be invasive into our world and it's going to come down and I am going to rule with you. And from now on, this is what it looks like to rule. This is what it looks like to live as a citizen of the kingdom. And Jesus comes and he says, repent, turn. Your ways aren't working. Stop the way you're doing it. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven, the way it's intended to be, is going to be reestablished. Not in a way with authority, not in a way with power, not in a way with borders or a government or any of those things, because that doesn't work. We've seen it tried and again and again, and this is the story that continues from the beginning of God giving rulership, giving kingship of the kingdom over to us. He says, now, not only will you live as citizens of my kingdom, but the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. Therefore, everything in your life needs to change. And every single message Jesus will preach, every single story we read, every single miracle will be built upon this theme from here on out that we've got to change. Why? Because we were designed to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And we've twisted it. We've mismanaged it. We're not doing it the way that the boss has said to do it. And he goes, so from now on, your life, which is the illustration of this coffee shop, has to be lived my way. Continue. And you're like, continue? Isn't that enough? Uh, Not quite yet. Because this is the thing. Now God will invite each and every one of us to be part of this kingdom and follow him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 says this. Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon, whose nickname was Peter, which means rock, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. That's like the only reason you cast nets into the lake. And then he said this. Come, follow me. Circle, highlighter, underline in your Bible. Come and follow me. And he goes, and I will send you out. Circle, highlighter, underline, send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets. Circle, highlighter, underline, left their nets too. Why not? And followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. And immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. Uh, Some of you who have been around church for a while have heard this story. When I was growing up in church, I always had this idea of, like, super charismatic, hypnotic Jesus. Where Jesus just walked up to somebody and goes, follow me. And they're in the middle of fishing, they're like... Follow Jesus. Like, and that's, that's how I read it. And it's like they just leave everything. They just drop things and they're like, go. And I'm like, man, Jesus has got some crazy hypnotism powers. He is crazy charismatic. His scores are off the chart. What is going on with the story? So beside this story, do me a favor and in your margin of your Bible, write Luke 5. It just gives a bigger expansion of the story. I don't have time to go into it today, but it's this beautiful story that tells about how Peter and John and James have been fishing all night. Now, we already know the story that Peter, James, and John were fishermen because their daddies were fishermen. Scripture doesn't say so, but I'm willing to bet that their grandpappy was fisherman and great-grandpappy was a fisherman before them. They have been doing this generationally. They have lived their life on this lake, and they know how to fish. They know all the good spots. They know where to fish. They know how to fish, and they know the time to fish. They were out all night. Why at night? Because you catch the fish at night. One, because you're throwing like a giant net on top of them, and if it's dark, they don't see it coming. If it's daylight, they're like, ah, net, and they scatter. And they know where to fish. You fish in the deep, cooler parts of the lake. You fish where they feed. You fish fish at the source of the river feeding into the Galilee. You fish at the Jordan River. You fish at these certain places at certain times. And it says all night long, they had caught nothing in Luke chapter 5. It says, so they were there in the morning cleaning their nets, repairing them. They got snagged on rocks, and afterwards, you got to repair your nets, you got to clean your nets, you got to do all this work when you get back in. They had finally hauled the boats in, they had finally hauled the nets in, and finished everything. And it says, early in the morning when they had finished, Jesus showed up, and he was ready to teach. And there was a crowd of people who showed up to the lake, because they couldn't fit them all in church, so they had to go somewhere. Jesus is by the lake, and this enormous crowd shows up, and he looks at Peter, and he goes, hey, take me out in the boat. 
Because all I need to do is sit in the boat, and the acoustics of the water will, look like, will function like an auditorium, carry his voice out through the people so everybody can hear. And essentially, he goes out of the boat and just sits there. And Peter's only job is to sit there in the back of the boat, staring at the back of Jesus' head, just trying to keep him facing forward, shifting the oars from time to time, keeping Jesus facing the crowd, and Jesus teaches. And Peter's got a back row seat to it. And he's like, man, this is cool. Jesus finishes. He dismisses the crowd, but instead of going and shaking people's hands, he looks at Pete and goes, let's go fishing. And Peter goes, okay, Jesus, you may be the Messiah. You may be the Son of God. You may know a lot about life. You may be a pretty good teacher, but I know fishing. This is the worst time of day to go fishing. I just finished repairing the nets. I just brought everything in. This does not work. We're in the shallows right now, which is not where the fish are. We're by the shore. There are a million people right here. They're being super loud. Like, if you've ever been fishing with your kids, you know that the whole time you're just like, There are like a thousand people on the shore. They're all glamoring. There are no fish. Jesus just looks at him. Peter goes, all right, because you say so. And he threw his nets over the side, and it says he caught a haul of fish so large that he could not bring it in. And as he tried, it began to swamp the boat. There were so many fish that James and John grabbed their boat and they had out there to haul, try and haul it all in. And even so, there's not enough. And Peter can't believe what he's just seen. He's done this all this, his life. Have you ever like, had that one thing that you were supposed to do well and it's not going well? Like, Peter, you are a fisherman. You have one thing and you have nothing to show for it. Jesus goes, follow me. Peter falls on his face and he goes, listen, I don't know who you are, but I know this. I'm a sinful person. I don't deserve to be around you. Take you and your whole Jesus act and get away from me because I'm going to screw it up too. Like, Jesus, you don't want a guy like me on your team. And I know you just taught, but you were seen in my boat. And if you don't leave now, they're going to affiliate you and your ministry with me. And it's all going to be jacked up. Jesus looks at him and smiles and says, follow me. And it was not just an invitation to say, come and follow me. That doesn't work. This week, I want you to walk in somewhere, anywhere. Starbucks, McDonald's, H-E-B. I just want you to walk into a crowd and look at everybody and say, follow me. And turn around and walk out and see what happens. Like, unless the building is on fire or they're really looking for a religious cult, it's not going to go well for you. Like, people don't do that. But when you read the backstory in Luke chapter 5, And Jesus says, follow me. And you've seen the things that Peter has seen. And you know the things that Peter knows. The only logical thing is to abandon everything and follow this guy. Not only that, but this was not just an invitation to say, hey, follow me. I'm going over here. Let's grab coffee. This was an invitation to be his disciple. This was an invitation to follow Jesus. And a couple things we want to leave on your creek notes. Second section says this. Number one, a citizen of the kingdom or a disciple. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. That's the fill in the blank word for there. It's called to do three things. The first one is this, follow. A citizen of kingdom or a disciple of Jesus is called to follow. You see, it's interesting because story after story here, Jesus doesn't go to the lake and say, hey, Everybody here, believe in me and go to heaven when you die. Like, raise your hand if you want to say a prayer. I see that hand. I see that hand. And that's not what happens. And he's like, whew, one and done. We're good. Everybody, you know, go swimming, whatever you want to do. I'm, I'm off to the next town. No, 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 that's not what he does. You see, every time it's the same calling, he says, follow me. Become my disciple. Not because you're going to heaven, but because heaven has come near. Which means the rule and reign of heaven now needs to be in your life. And every area of your life now must be subject to your new king. The world is going to look entirely different. 
When he says, come and follow me, he's saying basically, come and, and be my disciple, be my follower. We, we did a series about this. If you want to go online and check it out, it's in our Reframe series. We did a long thing about Hebrew discipleship and the background of it. I encourage you to go, because if I nerd on to that, we are not getting out of here till 1 o'clock, and, and, and Terry's preaching after that. So um, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to cause him to have any delay. But basically, to follow Jesus is not like, hey, I follow him on Instagram. Like, I'm his biggest fan. No, to follow Jesus, it simply means to say, I'm going to walk with you. It's essentially saying, I will be your disciple. And we don't understand this in our highly individualistic culture, where we know that each and every one of us are uniquely created. We have a unique DNA strand. We have unique fingerprints. And each and every one of us are incredibly individual. And I love that God created us that way. But to be a disciple was not to say, hey, I'm going to like figure out who I'm supposed to be. To be a disciple meant, I'm going to be you when you grow up. You would imitate the mannerisms of your master, of your rabbi. You would imitate his eating patterns. You would imitate his walking patterns. There was a blessing in the Hebrew language which simply said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Meaning, would you follow him so closely that like the dust that kicks up off his feet is like landing on you? Would you follow him with that kind of thing? And if you agreed to be a disciple of a rabbi, it was essentially reordering your life around three things. To be with your rabbi to become like your rabbi, and then to do what your rabbi does. Those are the three goals of a disciple. I'm going to be with you 24-7. You would follow him. It wasn't like an allegory, like, oh yeah, I follow him on Instagram. You would literally follow him. You would eat when he ate. You would sleep where he slept. You would stay where he stayed, and you would be his apprentice 24-7 for the next three years. That was what Jesus was asking them to do. Be with me. All the time. Why? So that you can become like me. And then I want you to do what I do. You see, if you are apprenticed to a plumber, your ultimate goal is to plum. Sure, that's a word. Your ultimate goal is, that, is to actually learn how to become an efficient plumber. If you're apprenticed to a carpenter, your ultimate goal is to like build a shelf. I don't, I don't know. Whatever it is. You are to like learn all the skills that that person had. Once again, if you go back to our Reframe series and watch that, we talked a lot about this. We broke this down about what it means to be with our rabbi, to be with Jesus, what it means to become like Jesus, and what it is to do what Jesus does, what we call being on mission. And essentially, when he says, follow me, what he's saying is, is he's saying, hey, become like me, be my disciple. I'm not asking you to pray so you go to heaven when you die. I'm asking you to follow and live in this way now. Because heaven is not just a place, it is a way of life. A way in which you live. And the citizens of heaven live differently than everybody else. And we're going to get into it. In the next three chapters, we're going to get deep into it. And time after time, Jesus is going to say, you can't live this way anymore. You have to surrender this. You can't live this way anymore. You have to surrender this. You can't live this way anymore. You have to surrender this. Why? Because you have to repent. Turn from the way you're doing it because now you are following me as a citizen of heaven. And each and every one of us as disciples or citizens are called to follow. And you need to understand this because I am going to ask you to do some... Actually, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. Jesus is going to ask you to do some super hard stuff. And I want you to be prepared for it. And so now I just want to ask, are you ready to follow? Because Jesus forces these disciples into this point where they have to make a decision where they're going to follow him or not. And he forces the decision with an invitation. Are you going to be my disciple or not? Are you going to follow me or not? And today, each and every one of you are forced with that same decision, are confronted with that same invitation. And we can't get around that. Are we going to repent and become citizens of the kingdom? And is our life going to change? Are we going to follow? Last week, Jonathan chopped through the first chapter of chapter 4, and we were joking on Tuesday. He's like, man, I got done so early. And I'm like, it's okay. It's going to encourage me to not preach as long today. That did not happen because uh, I'm still up here. So I'm going to try and wrap this up in the next, like, two minutes. All right, number three is this. Number two on your list is this. When you follow a citizen of the heaven or a disciple, you are called to follow, but you are also called to leave some things behind. Like, they were called to leave not only their boats, not only their nets. Then it says, they left their father in the boat. I'm like, son, where are you going? I can't help it. I'm compelled to follow Jesus. 
It's not how it was. They had a choice to make. So this is going to be hard. I wonder how many of us are called to have a new father. I wonder how many of us had a father that we have to abandon the way that they taught us to live. Not in a disrespectful, dishonoring way, because scripture says honor your parents, honor your father and mother. But I wonder how many of us have to come to a point where we say, this is the way of my father, this is the way of my family, this is the way of the chains that I've been bound in, and I have to leave that. Because there's a new way and there's a new father. I love my dad. But you can only have one father. And I wonder if this illustration is in here simply to say, you have a new one. And that requires leaving your old heritage and your old family. The old way of life, however you were trained and raised to do things. We talked about this a while back in our Joy and Sorrow series, what we call generational curses. I wonder how many of us need to abandon those ways and simply follow a new father and be reparented in the way of Jesus. The other thing they left is not only their father, but then it says they left their, their, their boats and their nets, their livelihood. They left their fishing gear. Let me ask, and I just want to be very clear, fishing's not a bad thing. And yet they left it behind. Fishing's a great thing. I love going fishing at Thanksgiving. We just like had a little dock, you know, and we tried to fish. There were no fish biting unless you were Kai, who was my youngest son. And he had this innate ability. He would just put a hook and put a worm on a hook and he would slowly lower it without a fishing pole into the, like, the reeds. And I'm like, Kai, there are no fish. Like, and you're fishing in the wrong spot. And he goes, no, daddy, I'm trying to catch the world's smallest fish. And I'm like, good luck with that kid. He caught Eight this big, each and every one of them. And it wasn't the same fish. You put them in jars, and it kept on repeating the process. I'm like, how are you doing this? I don't know where I was going with that. Fishing's not a bad thing. Okay. All right. Or be fishers of men. I don't know. I'm, I'm really lost. Um, and so all that to say, fishing's not a bad thing, and yet they had to leave some good things to pursue some God things. They had to leave their livelihood. Most of you, I don't think if you follow in the way of Jesus, he'll call you to quit your job. Most of you. Some of you, it's happened before. Uh, but I don't think he'll call you to quit your job. More likely, he will call you to continue working in a way that shines light in the darkness like we read in chapter 4. In a way that is so different from the rest of the world that they see your good deeds and they glorify your Father who's in heaven. Sometimes, he'll call you away from things you love. Sometimes he'll call you away from the job, too. Most of the time, he's calling us to a way, though. I, I can't say what he's going to do, but there will be a call to leave some things behind. I don't know what that will be for you. But as we dive deeper and deeper into the Sermon on the Mount, I do know that he's going to call you to leave behind your anger. He's going to call you to leave behind your lust. He's going to call you to leave behind your vengeance, some of which is well-deserved. And he'll say, leave all that. And follow me. Then finally, he calls us to a mission. And he goes, go. And he says, God has calls us to a mission. He says, come and follow me. And immediately attach to follow me and be my disciple. He goes, and I will make you fishers of men. Just like you caught fish, you're now going to catch people. And this wasn't, uh, this wasn't some just kind of pun on Jesus' part. Like, hey, you're fishing for fish and now you'll fish for people. Jesus is actually much funnier than that. And, and if you get into scripture, once again, we'll get into it. But this was actually, Jesus said, hey, I am a fisher of men. What that means is he had an uncanny knack for being able to hook people for the way he taught, for the way that he was so compelling, for the way that he lived his life, that people just flocked to him. He goes, if you follow me, you will also have this ability that people flock to you and you will be compelling and you will be able to spread the gospel. You see, attached to the very first thing, follow me, be my disciple, he also gives us a mission which says, you're not just supposed to be a disciple, you're supposed to be a disciple-making disciple. You see, you've been given a mission. It's to let other people know the way of Jesus. You see, the reason we're called to follow Jesus and live in the way of Jesus is so that we can become like him and then do what he does and call other people to the mission, which is where we end off on chapter 4. 
Verse 23 says this, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of heaven. He goes, so the way you thought life worked, let me retrain you, let me reteach you. There's a different way. Repent, in other words. Proclaiming the good news of God, letting people know, hey, the kingdom has come. Heaven is invasive. It's not a place you go to, but heaven is here now, and you have to change your life. You have to change your ways. And then, healing every disease and sickness among the people. Guys, some of you are going to find healing in this series. I'm not physical, maybe physical, but I believe emotional. I believe spiritual. I believe there's a lot of healing that's going to come with forgiveness that comes from this. I believe there's going to be a lot of things that are let go when we come into this, and God is going to draw you closer to him. And the news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought him all who were ill with various diseases, and those suffering in severe pain, and the demon possessed, and those who were having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And large crowds from the Galilee, Decapolis, which is an area meaning 10 Roman cities, meaning people who were not part of the Jewish kingdom, follow Jesus now. From Jerusalem, meaning the capitals, the cities. From Judea, meaning the rural areas. And the region across the Jordan, everybody followed him. You see, this is an invitation today to allow the kingdom of heaven to invade your life. The invitation today is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Most of you at some point have made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. Most of you, it was with a, Jesus take me to heaven when I die once and done prayer and then you were baptized. And that is not the call of Jesus. It goes so much deeper than that. To say, oh, I have to be retrained as a citizen of heaven. I have to learn the way. You see, we're calling this series, This is the Way. So, most of you don't know this. There's a new show on Disney Plus called The Mandalorian. Uh, For those of you who are Star Wars fans, uh, it it was like a light shining in the darkness. But there's this line that they use in The Mandalorian which simply says, this is the way. And every time there's a disagreement, anytime there's a problem, anytime someone deviates from the path, they simply look at each other and say, this is the way, and everybody echoes back, this is the way. And it's almost like, well, that ended the conversation. That ended the conflict. That ended whatever it was. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this should be the church. And I began kicking myself that I didn't come up with this seven years before the Mandalorian because now it seems like I'm copying them. But do you know the original name for Christians? In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 21, we were all called followers of the way. Because Jesus came and he goes, this is the way. Walk in it. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be learning about the way. And I'm going to be saying things to you like, this is the way. And you're going to respond, this is the way. I'm going to bring my Mandalorian helmet. It's going to be epic. But more than that, we are going to learn and walk in the way of Jesus. The nerdy stuff I'm going to do, okay, there will be a little bit of Star Wars, but the nerdy stuff I'm going to do is really going to be unpacking Scripture so that we say, wow, I've heard this story so many times, but I never let it seep through into my heart. And so my prayer for this series as we get going is this will transform our lives so that as we follow Jesus, we will become fishers of men, that your life, not your words, your life and your words, will become so compelling to those who do not know Jesus that it will blow them away. And they will become followers of the way of Jesus. And what will happen is the kingdom of heaven will advance. And more citizens will come. And they will find the way of Jesus. And the kingdom of God will advance as we surrender areas of our lives which were previously not surrendered to him. And God will be glorified. And we will walk in the way. Would you pray with me? God, as we move into this, I simply pray that you would transform our hearts. God, it's such a simple sentence. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And so many times we think, wow, judgment's coming and all this stuff. But that's not at all what he meant. It's simply the idea that your life is not working. The path you're walking on is not the path. So follow me. 
And that will change your life and that will make you fishers of men because from now on the kingdom of God is being invasive and it's in your hearts and the kingdom of God will be the subversive kingdom that will spread throughout the world. God, let us live in that way. If you're here today and you've never decided to follow Jesus Christ and you want to make that decision, I want to let you know we would love to talk to you about the first time decision to say, God, I I want to follow you. And we want you to receive his Holy Spirit. If that's your prayer today, I simply want you to pray this. God, my life is not working out the way it should. I need to repent. I need to turn and try a new way. And God, you offer me this way. And so I want to follow you instead of me. God, whatever I need to leave behind, I leave behind. Would you transform me and allow me not to just to be a citizen of your kingdom, but a son or daughter of God? It's in your name we pray. Amen. The last blank in your creek note was simply this. God has invaded planet Earth. That's what he meant when the kingdom of God has come near. You see, Jesus was not crucified because he said tremendous things like love your neighbor. You don't kill people who say love each other. What Jesus did is he said, no, 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 no. I am planting a subversive kingdom which is going to take over. I'm the true ruler of the universe. And I'm going to come and live in this way and teach you how to be my citizens. Jesus was on a recruiting mission for a subversive kingdom that had invaded the planet and it threatened people. And just like Herod, people were terrified of it. And I say that to say this, and you're invited into this kingdom. And it might scare some of you, but I promise you, if you stick with us, you're going to find a better way. Would you stand as we continue in worship this morning?